The desire of Titus Women is to invite women around the world to know Jesus as their Savior, Center, and Source. May God guide and encourage you through this message. So excited about John 4. I've been uh, living on it. I spoke on it last weekend when I was in West Virginia. And ever since, I've just, I, this story has come alive in such a beautiful way. One of the things I think that is so important about this story is, is that we begin to see Jesus open up, open up the good news for the entire world. And not only that, but we begin to see the life-giving water of Jesus and where it flows and what happens when the water of life flows from the heart of Jesus into our lives. And this seems like the best news of all best news. <laughs> um, and so as I've been living it with this week, I found myself in tears over and over again. So tonight we're going to deal with some of the larger themes, and um, I am praying that I'm praying that none of us get overwhelmed. But I think there's a beauty about what Jesus wants to say. Now, remember who's the main character in the Gospel of John? The Father. Remember the Father. And so, what we I want you to remember, and I was thinking about, I want you to remember this: that He is the one that is ordering the pieces of this story, and so you'll begin to understand the relationship between Jesus, the intimacy, but also um, the way the father's at work. And that's what Jesus talks about throughout the entire book. The father's at work and Jesus is just doing what he sees the father doing. He's saying the words that he hears the father saying. Um, and I, that's really important because one of the things, remember like the father's orchestrating the situation, the story in John two with the wedding of Cana. And so he, he planned redemptive history to begin at a wedding. and. I believe with all my heart that this story was planned very intentionally at a well in Samaria and that the father was planning it. And he was in the process of redeeming his people and redeeming the rest of the world. He wanted to redeem the past story of his, of his own people. And then he wanted to open up the gospel for the entire world. Um, and so this is the pivot moment. And we have this little woman, right? This little woman who plays this pivotal role in a redemptive story um, that encompasses the entire world. Now, I want to say that there, we're looking at the five lenses. So I, I, we're going to, these are going to kind of blur together tonight, but I, I want you to have them in your mind so that you're thinking. We're going to look at the context, the historical, um, God's larger story. We're going to look at the theology. What does this passage say about the heart, especially about the heart of the Father? But also tonight, what does salvation look like? What is salvation? We're going to look at the personal story. And this just blows my mind because if you see this story in its larger context, then all of a sudden you see this one moment, the particulars of her story. You're going to see her personality, which is a strong personality. And all of a sudden, it, this is just a beautiful um, picture of what the incarnation is. The God who's got his arms around the whole universe steps into space and time. And with a particular person, in a particular moment, he changes the history of the world. And that's what we see in her story. And then missional, right? Because what are we also saying? We're, we're, salvation for us is always for the sake of another. It's never just to stop in our hearts. It's always that living water. That's what we're talking about tonight, the living water um, that flows to the next. And then what are the practical applications? How does, how does this living water flow in my life and how do I receive it? So th that's kind of what we have in the back of our minds. And uh, and so as we start, this is this is our next picture, which I love so much. And you'll see it in just a minute um, with Jesus, too. But this is the Samaritan woman with her water pot. And um, next week, we're going to have all the pictures and we can show them to you. But this is the Samaritan woman. Um, and what the title of this is the living water flows backwards and it flows forwards. So when we receive the living water, um, and that's what I think Jesus wants to say. So we're going to start with the first six verses. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar near the field that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. Okay, I want you to look at this map 
because you'll see at the bottom, if you can find Jerusalem, if you can find Jerusalem, you're going to, Jesus walks up all the way to the top, from the top of the yellow, all the way to the top of the blue. And if you look in the, if you look in the gospels, he makes this trek over and over and over again. And Often what the Jews would do is they would walk around, they would walk around Samaria and then they would come up to, they would come up to that Sea of Galilee, which is at the top of the blue. Um, so that, that is kind of the, that is kind of the setup. Now, here's what I want to say first, as we have that, there are four context clues that are really interesting that we get in these first six verses. And I, I don't think we can miss them. Um, and the first one, it has immediate practical implications for us. Jesus has no interest in maintaining the status quo in our lives. Everywhere Jesus goes in the gospel, he creates a hullabaloo. Everywhere. Everywhere he goes, he stirs things up. And sometimes it's for good. Sometimes it's for controversy. But he never leaves things at the status quo. And what you're going to find at the very interesting, Jesus learned that the Pharisees were talking about who was making more disciples. And while this was happening and they were talking about Jesus, all this was going on about Jesus. And so Jesus says, I'm going to, I'm going to leave and go somewhere else. And where does he go? He goes to Samaria. And then uh, everything, everything is turned upside down as well. I think the very first thing, if we want to have an encounter with Jesus, a new encounter with Jesus, we have to be willing to say to him, I'm willing for you to break up the status quo. And I'm willing to be made uncomfortable. And we, um, we, we want very much to be comfortable. We want to settle into our little lives and we have, want to have our needs met and our children happy and our little world safe and secure. And we will find in the story that that is not the heart of God for his world. He, the river of life flows through our lives and out to the world and it is rushing and it is raging. And there is a sense of, will you get into the stream of the spirit? I remember very clearly being in um, a situation one time and I thought I um, am swimming around in a little mud puddle and the, I know the stream of the spirit is right outside the door. And I felt like Jesus said, if you just get up out of this circumstance and walk out the door, you can be in the stream of the spirit. Jesus doesn't really want us to stay in our little mud puddles. He wants us to be willing to let him, Jesus, and he's, he's, you're going to see that he does this for the disciples in a big way, right, in this story. So Jesus decide, he decides to go straight through Samaria. He doesn't go around. He goes through, straight through. The Samaritans hated the Jews, and the Jews, the Jews hated the Samaritans. They didn't talk to one another. They didn't have fellowship with one another. Um, they, they despised one another. So Jesus decides to stop for a rest in Sychar of Samaria. And um, I think it's, this, is really, this is really important. Um, Sychar in the, in the New Testament is the same place as Shechem in the Old Testament. And I want to tell you a little bit about the history of this location, because I think God the Father has planned this story. And there's some really important things that happen here. And I think this really matters for the Samaritan woman story. So the first thing that happens is there's an altar built. In Genesis 32, you have, um, you have Jacob wrestling with God and getting his new name, Israel. Then you have um, him meeting Esau and forgiveness and reconciliation happened with Esau. And then at the end of um, Genesis 33, he comes to Shechem and he builds an altar and he calls it God, the God of Israel. So remember, Jacob had said, God, if you'll take me out and bring me back, then you will be my God, not just the God of my father and my father's father, but you will be my God. And so this is the place that Jacob declares that God is his God, the God of Israel. The very next story um, in Genesis 34 is the story of Dinah. I want you to think about the Samaritan woman. This is the story of Dinah. There are 12 sons. And all the 12 sons write the story of blessing on the 12 sons. And there's one daughter we know of. And this daughter in Genesis 34 experiences sexual assault. And then um, her brothers find out about it. And in revenge, there's a thirst for, um, for revenge. And so violence is committed and all the men in the village are wiped out. So you have sexual abuse and then you have violence on top of it. And I think it's the worst story in Genesis. And I, I didn't, I, I, I have trouble with Jesus, why he allowed it. <laughs> 
And then in Joshua 24, um, this is the land that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. This land where this well was, Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. And so and jo jo as Joseph is dying, he says, don't bury me in Egypt. I want you to take me back to the promised land. I want to be buried in the promised land. And it is here at this place where Joseph, Joshua brings the bones of Joseph. And the very last chapter in Joshua, Joshua stands up and says, we're going to renew the covenant. Choose you this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And then they bury the bones of Joseph in this ground. The promise that was given, right? Joseph says, I want to be part of it. And at the beginning of the, of the, of the, pro, of the fulfillment of that promise, he's buried there. And then, and then um, David becomes king, Solomon becomes king, and then remember Rehoboam becomes king. And then there's tension and Rehoboam, they said, make it easier for us. And he said, no, I'm not, I'm going to make it harder than my father did. And so the division starts to come and under Jeroboam, the division comes. And this place becomes the capital of that king, of the Northern kingdom. In 772, the northern nation is taken captive um, because they have they have been disobedient and unfaithful to the Lord. They're taken captive and they leave just a few of the poorest of the poor in that place. And what happens is um, then some Assyrians come in and the poor of, of the people of Israel marry with the Assyrians and they become the Samaritans. Syker, Shechem, was a major trade route from Jerusalem to Galilee and also from the north to the from the from the east to the west. So it sat kind of right in the middle and was a major trade route. So it's a very, very important place. And you say, okay, cricket, what in the world? <laughs> Here's what I want us to think. Jesus stops for a rest in this place. And I think it's very important. I think it's very important that the place that he stops for a rest is the place where Jacob declared, God is my God. I think it's very important that an abuse happens here because I think God is in the process of redeeming that abuse. I think it's very important that a covenant was renewed here and also that a promise was, there. Was, Joseph's burial was a promise of the future, right? And um, I think the kingdom was divided here. And I think what Jesus does when he sits for a rest in this place is says, I have come, I have come to make, to honor the declaration of Jacob, to heal the wound of Dinah, to fulfill the promise of Joseph, and to unify a nation that is divided. And you can say, Cricket, I think you're overstepping. And I'm just going to say, look it up. Look it up. Look at Genesis 33. Look at Joshua 24. And then look at the book of John. The book of John begins, in the beginning was the word. He takes us back to Genesis 1, 1. Then he takes us back to Genesis 1 and 2 with the wedding at Cana. And here he takes us right back into Israel's history. And he says, I want to honor the places that they followed me. And I want to redeem the unfaithful places. And I'm in the process of writing a big story. And do you know what I believe with all my heart? That over, <laughs> over the watchtower of heaven, over the, the wall of heaven, there were four people leaning over watching this unfold. Jacob, Dinah, Joseph, and Joshua. And they were watching. God himself is showing up and he's showing up in the place where all of this occurred. What in the world is he going to do now? That's what I think. And this is what I think. Not only does he stop here in this place, he stops at a well. And you say, cricket, why does that even matter? And I just want to tell you this. If you look back in the Old Testament, wells are places lots of times where love stories happen. And I think that's what this is. I think this story is a love story between the heart of the father and a woman. I think it's between the heart of a father and his own people and I think it's a love story between the heart of a father and the whole world. 
And I think he's saying, I love you with an everlasting love. And I am going to prove it by sending my son. And he's going to sit right smack dab in the middle of this story. You can look up Hagar and Yahweh where he provides. And she says, you are the God who sees. Isaac and Rebecca, the longest chapter in Genesis is on their love story. Jacob don't meet at a well. And I, I was thinking, well, it also sometimes there's contention at wells because wells were places of convection. And this story in, in John 4, a place of a little contention. She gets a little feisty on him. But here's the thing. Remember the story, Isaac and the men of Gerar, and they're fighting over this well. Is, this is our well. No, this is our well. And finally, um, God just pulls Isaac back and meets Isaac. And then he builds an altar. And then he builds a new well. And that um, that well is the well um, where they sit in John Wells are a place of connection. They're a place where love stories are written in the Old Testament. And then there's one more thing. And John is very specific. Now, if you do another study on time, I had this in your homework, and then I thought it might be more than we needed to handle. But if you do a study on time in the book of John, you will find that time is very important. The hour is said over and over and over again, maybe 17 times, maybe more. I don't remember exactly, but. And Jesus is always saying, it's not my hour. It's not my hour. And then he's saying, it is my hour. And the hour of certain things is told when certain things happen. Because it, John is writing a theological story. And so he is trying to say, God has stepped in. He stepped into a moment of time. And in, in God stepping into that moment in time, he's encompassing all of time in himself. And I want to tell you, there are only two things in the Gospel of John that happen at the sixth hour. One is this encounter with the woman of Samaria and with the other is the cross. And do you know what? When I realized that it was so meaningful to me because this is what I think. I think the shadow of the cross shines over this story. <laughs> and I think it shines all the way back into Israel's history. And I think the shadow of the cross shines from this story all the way. And I think it covers the whole entire world. And I think it, John is very intentional. If you think of, if you think of um, how John uses time in the Judas story, remember, Jesus says someone's going to betray me. And um, then he says, it's whoever I give this cup to. And Judas takes it. And it, then it says the devil entered it. He went out and it was night. I think he's, I think John is very intentional about the time of day. I think he's very intentional to say, and I think there's a reason. That this happens at this hour. So these are the four things I want us to think about. And this is our context. I think that I think what Jesus is doing is trying to cast a shadow of the cross and of redemption. What is redemption? And what does it mean for redemption in our own lives? But what does it mean when God wants to redeem a history, a nation? What does it mean when he wants to redeem a race? What does it mean when he wants to redeem families that are broken apart? What does it mean when he wants to bring people together that have been estranged? What does that mean? I think this is the story where he wants to make that known. I love this because she actually, I, I love, it doesn't say this in the text, but I love it because Jesus is holding the water that she gave him, right? So it doesn't say she gave him water in the text, but I love that he receives from her hand and then he's about to offer her more than she ever dreamed. All right, so here's, here's what I want to read. This is verse 7. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone to the city by, to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Are you greater than our father, Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from himself, as did his sons and livestock. And Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this well will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty forever. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, sir, Give me this water so I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. All right. I love this story. And we just have to, this is the encounter. Jesus opens the conversation. He always initiates. He always initiates. We are never first. 
So he opens it. He's sitting there. He's tired. And there she comes. Now, I want to I want to dwell a little bit on her personality. We've heard a lot of sermons about her being um, a very sinful woman and about her being so ashamed. She doesn't want to come with the villagers. But if you actually look at what Jesus, she says to Jesus, she's a pretty tough woman. And she may not have wanted to mess with the other villagers, but I don't think she's living in shame. And I, I, I don't I think she's living. Uh, I think she's been wounded. And I think she is. Um, and I think she is. There's a an aggressiveness, a sarcasm, a cynicism. So listen, listen to the three things that she says to Jesus. She says, you're breaking the rules. <laughs> you're not supposed to talk to me. Then the next thing she says is, really, who do you think you are? And then the next thing she says is give it to me. So she was a woman. She did not come to Jesus submissive and, and timid and quiet and ashamed. She came to Jesus pretty abrasive, upfront. Who do you think you are? And why in the world are you talking to me? And um, it didn't bother Jesus one bit. And this is what I want to say. It doesn't matter how we come. When he initiates a conversation with us, he just wants us to come. Whatever our personality is, however we come, and he, he just wants us to engage him in conversation. And Jesus says, uh, and I love what Jesus says to her. She says, why are you talking to me? You're breaking the rules. You're a Jew. You're a man. And I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you speaking to me? And he says this. And I, I've been saying this to Jesus all week. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him. And he would have given you living water. I keep saying to, to Jesus, if you knew, if you knew the gift, if you knew who's offering it, you would ask. And if we knew the gift, if we believe the giver, if we would ask, then he would give. And uh, the, what she says to him. You have nothing to draw with. The well is deep. Where are you going to get it? Are you greater than our father, Jacob? And then Jesus says such beautiful words. Whoever drinks of the water I will give him will never be thirsty forever. And I want to tell you about that because it's not I will never be thirsty again. In Hebrew and in Greek, the word that's used here, the word for forever in Hebrew is like an age and beyond. It's like it's not like a, it, it's, it's kind of, there's an ongoing sense to it. It's like a word with no ending. And this is what the word is used here. Um, you will never be thirsty forever. He's offering her a satisfaction that she can't even dream of. And, uh, and I love her because she says instantly, give it to me. And here's what I love about this lady. Um, she enters into conversation with him. He asks her for something and she enters into conversation. He offers her something and she wants it. She's curious. She's inquisitive. She, she engages him in conversation. And when he offers her living water, she instantaneously says, yeah, I want that. She doesn't understand, but she knows she wants to keep talking to him. And she knows whatever he has to offer, she wants it. And uh, she says, sir, give me this water. And then I won't have the hassle of coming here and having to draw water. And then I love what Jesus does. He takes a step back. And, uh, and then he says, okay, I'll give it to you. You go and call your husband. And this is interesting because Jesus says, invites her to call her husband. And she doesn't hide from him, right? She said, well, she, she doesn't tell the truth. She says, I don't have a husband. And then Jesus says, no, but you've had five and the man you're living with is not your husband. And what I love her response. She doesn't deny it. She doesn't try to explain it. She doesn't run away. She keeps talking. And, uh, and she says, um, I perceive you're a prophet. Have you ever been in a place with Jesus where he said something about your life and maybe revealed to you some darkness that he wanted to bring to the light? And what we do in that ma moment may matter more than anything, right? There's something in your heart and I want to bring it to the light. And what do we do? And I love her response. And I think that's going to be my response from anytime he says, cricket, I want that, that response, that I want that to come to the light. I want to say, sir, I perceive, you know what you're talking about. <laughs> 
because that is what I think she said. Sir, I perceive that you know something about me. You must be from God. And I love it because then what does she do? She continues the conversation. And what does he do? He lets it go at that. Sometimes we think he's going to dredge up all this stuff from our past. And we're going to have to go through. And we're going to have to confess. And we're going to have to say all. And sometimes he just says, let me just shine my light on it. Just shine the light. As the light comes, the darkness flees. And as the light comes, healing can come. Just keep talking to me. Keep engaging me in conversation. That is exactly what she does. She says, I perceive you're a part of it. So let me ask you a question. Are we supposed to worship here on this mountain? Or are we supposed to worship here on this mountain? The Jews say one thing. The Samaritans say one thing. What do you think? And I think she was probably trying to change the subject, but it didn't matter. She was still talking to him. That's what I love. And Jesus talks to her about it. And then, and then what does he say? He says, uh, Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming. When neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. And then listen to this line. I think it's my favorite. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. The Father is seeking those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. The father is seeking the heart of that Samaritan woman. I love that. I think Jesus is saying to her, he's seeking you. He's seeking you. The, when the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and truth. The father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And then she says to him, well, I know the Messiah is coming. And when he comes, he's going to sort all this out. And then what does Jesus say? Two things. He says, I am the Messiah and I am sorting it out. That's one thing that he says. And then he also says, I am the I am. And this passage in John, we could do another study on the I am from Exodus 3 in the book of John. And all the I am statements in John originate there. But there are several times where he just says, I am. And that's what this is. I who speak to you am. That's how he, that was how it's phrased. I who speak to you. And he does it in chapter six. He does it in chapter eight. He does it twice in chapter eight. I who speak to you am. I am the great I am. I am the one that sustains all life. I am the one behind all of creation. And, and uh, in theological terms, it's a, this word aseity. I have existence in myself. Everyone else I says, I am because God himself says, I am. And I want you to think of this. It's a woman and they're at the well and she's been married five times. She doesn't have a good story. She's sarcastic and she's cynical. And what does he say to her? I, I am. There are no disciples around. There are no Samaritans around. There are no Pharisees around. There's no one else around. It's just a conversation between her and Jesus. This is what happens too in the story of Martha when he says, I am the resurrection and the life. And he says it to Martha. Jesus, I think, is trying to say one of the most important. I am the Messiah. I am sorting it out. I am the great I am. I am ever powerful. I am ever present. I am all life. And then this, I think this is funny. I think John must have laughed when he wrote this. Just then the disciples came back. <laughs> and I am sure because the Samaritans knew the Torah. So the, she knew Exodus 3. So she knew what he was saying to her. And you know, her heart started to skip a beat. And she said, what in the world? And I want to stop and say this. In those days, divorce, did, a woman did not choose to divorce her husband. I want you to think about this. Five times she had been put aside by a husband and then picked up by another man. Five times. So whatever her sin, and I'm sure I'm sure there was sin, whatever her sin, her heart was wounded to a level that we have trouble imagining. She had been picked up and rejected, picked up and rejected 
five, now six different times. And it is to this woman that Jesus says, I have something to offer you that will create in you a fulfillment of every thirst and will spring up in you forever. And I am the great I am. I have the authority to give it. And then the disciples come and they marvel that he's talking to a woman. And he's, she's, and one, and, but no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? And then the woman, I'm sure she got so flustered. The woman left her water jar, went away into town and said, come and see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? And they went out of town and were coming to him. Now, I love this. This has become maybe my favorite part of the story. And um, because I think something's happening here that we don't ever we don't ever talk about this part of the story. I believe when Jesus offers a living water, it's a living water that flows backwards as well as forwards. And that is what that is, that is what I want to say. Is a living water that covers the past, that covers the woundedness, that covers the rejection, that covers the sexual violence, that covers all the the burial ground, that covers the people divided. I believe the living water of God flows in two directions. And I believe everywhere it goes, it brings life. It brings hope. Everywhere the river flows, things are remade and reborn. And that is what I think is so beautiful when he says to her, I am the I am. He says, I have the authority to make these stories right. I have the story, I have the authority to right the wrongs done in the past. I have the authority to redeem every woman affected by sexual violence. I have the authority to make those stories right. And I'm going to do it with this woman and she's going to be the example of what I can do. And I'm going to redeem my people and I'm going to redeem this woman and I'm going to redeem a town because one little woman engaged me in conversation. Regardless of her brokenness, she said, I'm going to engage him. In, and I and Jesus said, I will reveal myself to her. The living water of God flows backwards. The living water of God flows forwards. And I believe with all my heart that that is the message that our world needs. <laughs> and I believe with all my heart that we don't have to live in. We don't have to live in the pain or the brokenness or the hurt. But Jesus says, I can do something with the blood of Jesus that cleanses and forgives and heals and binds up. So we don't live in the light of either historical wounds, personal wounds, family wounds. And not only we do not live in them, we do not perpetuate them. I think she went home to her boyfriend or the man she was living with and said, you know what? We got to make this right because I've met, I've met the Messiah. The water of life flows backwards. He redeems our past. He prepares us for our future. He heals our hurts and our wounds. He forgives us our sins and he sets us free. And we do not have to live in the past. And he says, there's a whole world and I need the living water to flow through you so that the world can be reached. And if we are so bent, right? And so afraid, that we can't ever let that living water flow through. Then we just live in our little mud puddle. And he says, I want to burst. I want to burst through. And then I want like this woman. <laughs> I want to, I want a whole, a whole group of people to know me because you let the living water, you received. And this is what I love. He redeems the abuse committed against Dinah. He seeks out a woman of Samaria. She's outcast. She's wounded. She's hurt. He heals her. He heals the, the generational sin. He is the God who makes all things right. He gives a new covenant, a new covenant of living water. And you know where else we find this? We find it, found it in Ezekiel 47, but you know where else we find it? In Revelation 22, the very last chapter of scripture, right? We find that the river of life flows. And uh, the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the lamb through the middle of the street of the city. And on either side of the river, the tree of life with 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, not just the families, not just individual hearts, but the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the lamb will be in it and his servants will worship him and they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads and night will be no more. 
They will need no light of lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light and will reign forever and ever. He's making a new covenant. And he is saying here, you don't even have to wait for heaven. I'll give it to you right now. The inheritance promise is received, right? So the promise for Joseph is received. The promised land, the fulfillment of all the Old Testament promises are fulfilled in Jesus. And Jesus says, I want to reunite the Jews and the Samaritans. And then do you know what the next story is in John? The one that comes after. It's the second sign that Jesus does in John. And it's just this tiny little story. And it was my least favorite story, except that it's for a Gentile. So the Samaritans were a mixed race and were despised because of their mix. The Gentiles, uh, the next story, Jesus heals the Gentile nobleman's son, right? So the story just starts getting bigger and bigger and bigger. He brings life everywhere he goes. And then, okay, and now we have, now we have the Samaritans coming up the hill. Okay, so, so she goes and says, hey, I've just met a man. He's told me all I've ever done. Could this be the Christ? And all that, and they listen to her, right? She's a pretty forceful, powerful personality. And they all, they all started going up the hill to Jacob's well. In the meantime, the disciples were there saying, Rabbi, eat. It's time for food. It's time for lunch. And he said, I have food you do not know anything about. And so they said to one another, well, someone brought him food? And he said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do not say there are four months and then comes the harvest. Look, I tell you, lift your eyes and see the fields are white for harvest. And do you know what? I think they looked up and there were the Samaritans walking up the hill. Already the one who weeps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life. So the sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true. One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Now I love to think of who was laboring for these Samaritans. Maybe it was Joshua. Maybe it was Jacob. Maybe it was Joseph. Maybe it was those who declared way back in history We declare God is our God. We believe his promises. We will hold on. Maybe they were the sowers. Maybe it was someone else. But the disciples are about to reap a harvest. And here's what I think happens. The Samaritans walk up the hill and there's Jesus. And some are talking to Jesus and some are saying to Peter and John, who is he? Who is he? And for the very first time, the disciples have the privilege to say, it's Jesus. He's the Messiah. And there is a whole harvest, that whole conversation of the townspeople and Jesus and the disciples, and they're all talking. And it says many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. And when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay two days. And do you know what? Jews didn't stay with Samaritans. Jews didn't talk to Samaritans. Jews didn't stay in Samaritan houses. Jews didn't eat Samaritan food. Jews didn't have anything to do with Samaritans. And I just giggled so much thinking about the disciples, like in their beds in the Samaritans' homes, (laughs) thinking like, we're not supposed to be here. What's Jesus doing? And for two days, right, two nights, two days, there they are as Jesus teaches the Samaritan people. And you know that woman is listening to every single word. And then another night, right, the disciples there eating their food. And all of a sudden, the disciples' paradigms are bursting wide open. And all of a sudden, the Samaritans are saying, it's for us too. The Messiah is here and he wants us. And the Samaritan woman is saying, what? This whole town is going to believe in you and you're using my life to reach this whole town. And then here's what happens. Many more believed because of Jesus's word. And then it's no longer because of what you said that we believe we have heard for ourselves. This is the heart of evangelism, right? I can tell you about how good Jesus is. I can tell you all the wonderful things he's done for me. I can tell you my testimony, but oh, that you would see for yourself how good he is. That's what Philip says to Nathaniel, come and see, come and see for yourself. And this is what the Samaritans say. They say, we see for ourselves. And then what is this? That this is indeed the savior of the world. 
the Savior of the Jews? Yes. The Savior of the Samaritans, too. The Savior of the Gentiles. The Savior of the world. And so for the very first time, these words are spoken. That Jesus is the Savior of the world. Now remember... Um, Remember our prayers to pray over our family that have to do with the names of Jesus. My mom's already said what our three are tonight. He's the giver of living water. He's the great I am. And he's the savior of the world. And in a little bit, we're going to put up some, um, we're going to put up some prayers that we can pray over our family, that we would invite Jesus in, that he would be. Uh, we would receive the living water and allow him to flow through our lives, doing whatever he wants to do. That we would believe he's the great I am. And that when we open our hearts to him, the great I am steps into time and space and he writes a new story through our lives, but not just for us, for all, for, for the whole world. And then he's the savior of the world. He's got the world on his heart. I love it because that missional aspect Every single story that um, is written in the Gospel of John. And I thought, well, what practically, right? Okay, let's think about this practical. Practically, what does a life look like when the water is flowing through? Because, you know, though we don't want to just be all about what do we do, um, what does a life look like? And I want to say this. It looks like life. It looks like creativity and curiosity. It looks like all of a sudden, there's an interest. Oh, I'm interested in what's going on. Oh, that's good news. Oh, maybe God wants to do this. Oh, I can see how to make this situation better. Oh, I'm thinking new thoughts. When the water of life is flowing through us, which is the gift of the Holy Spirit. When the water of life is flowing through us, we begin to live. Does he take us out of hard situations? Nope. In fact, sometimes he leads us right smack dab in the middle of a hard situation. But all of a sudden there, all of a sudden there's life. All of a sudden we think creatively of, oh, maybe we could do this or maybe we could do this. All of a sudden our worlds are transformed by his presence. It looks like joy. Joy because there's no suffering? No. But joy because we have encountered Jesus. And there's something about encountering Jesus every day in our place, in our own lives, in our places of joy and pain, as we encounter Jesus there, all of a sudden life takes on a beauty and a holiness, a sacredness, right? Because we could be doing the laundry or the dishes, or we could be driving in carpool, or we could be doing the normal work of life and we're encountering Jesus and he brings joy. That's what she was doing, right? She just getting her water for the day and she encountered Jesus and her life was never the same. Do you know when the river of life flows, flows through life, it looks beautiful, even in places of pain. And I want to tell you this. I went to a retreat last weekend and um, the lady who led the retreat and she was radiantly beautiful and she didn't know me. She just reached out and said, can you or your mama come? And I said, oh yeah, we can come. And so I went last weekend and she was radiant and she was gathering her community together for a ladies retreat. And it was in the mountains of West Virginia. It was beautiful. And um, said, um, I want to tell you my testimony at some point during the weekend. So I want to tell you my testimony for 18 years. I struggled with depression, 18 years and, uh, and then a severe depression. And then I went to a, a conference and I was prayed over and Jesus broke it. And he began to pour his joy in me and it bubbled over and it overflowed and he broke the spirit of depression and he broke the darkness. And all of a sudden the world, all of a sudden the world was a different place. And then she said, I started, when I started to go into menopause, this is the real deal. When I started to go into menopause, all of a sudden I felt that heaviness come back. And Jesus said to me, oh no, it's not. Oh, no, it's not. I set you free. And I tell you what, she was radiantly beautiful. Jesus had given her an idea and she was going for it with all her heart. And all of a sudden, a whole community came together. And at my table, there was an older woman and a younger woman in tears saying, I'm sorry. I'm sorry we haven't been there for you. I'm sorry about this. And all of a sudden, there was the, the water of life 
because of Brenda's love and obedience. And when, when that happens, whatever our situation is, whether we live in the mountains of West Virginia or we live in central Kentucky or we live in Sri Lanka or wherever we live, all of a sudden in our situation, God says, I want to do something creative and I want to do something new and I want to do it through your life. And you know what? It looks like reconciliation. It looks like open conversations. It looks like a welcome mat that says you are welcome in my home. You are welcome in my heart. The walls begin to come down. It looks like restored relationships. It looks like open mind. Think how think about the disciples in their minds, right? They were blown open by what God was doing, by what Jesus was doing. And you know they talked all the way back. They were going to Galilee. You know they talked the entire way. What in the world were you doing? What in the world is happening? As barriers start to be broken down and minds start to be opened up and healed and healing comes to wounded places. Jesus says life begins to flow and beauty begins to come and conversations begin to happen and restoration begins to happen. And best of all, others have an opportunity to meet Jesus for themselves. What does a, what does a life look like with a river of God flowing through it? It just looks like living full-hearted, open-hearted, joy-filled living that doesn't miss the opportunities that God gives, that knows to rest when we're tired, <laughs> to do everything for love of him, or we're living in that intimacy with him. And do you know what I think she lingered with him? I think this is one of the things I want to say, because you say, well, how, how do I get the living water? Here's what I want to say. She lingered. He started the conversation and she sat there with him. She waited. She was curious. She wanted what he had to offer. And when he exposed broken places in her life, she, she let him put his finger on it. She didn't back away. She kept the conversation going. And then she received all he had for. Her. And then ultimately, she believed. And that's the whole point of the Gospel of John. The purpose of the gospel of John is in John 20, 30 and 31. Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ and that believing you may have life in his name. I think some of us need to be like, are we living? Are we allowing the water of life to flow through our lives? We have a beautiful ending for you tonight. One of our own, um, Bonnie McKinney has a granddaughter. Her name is Carly Hale, and she recorded for us, I Speak Jesus. And um, I want us, I want, as we go to a prayer time, I want to, um, I want us to reflect on these questions. Are we willing to, ups the, to, for Jesus to upset the status quo in our lives? Do we believe that the Father is at work to redeem our past and prepare us for his future? Are we lingering in Jesus' presence? Are we interested in what he offers? Is he bringing any darkness to light? And if he is, will we take time to let him do it? Do we want to receive the living water? Are we willing to lift up our eyes to the harvest and declare that he is the savior of the world? And are we willing to pray for our families and our homes and our communities that that living water would bring healing to our past and to our futures? And um, so is, um, and then these are the prayers. These are the prayers that um, Jesus has laid on my heart to pray for my family that I'm adding them to the six other prayers we prayed about the names of Jesus. Jesus, you are the giver of living water. Flow through our homes with your cleansing, restoring, life-giving presence. Let your beauty and life, let beauty and life spring up in our homes because of you. Jesus, you are the great I am, the Messiah. You are ever present and all powerful. We worship you as the author and giver of life and our redeemer. Breathe life into our homes and our hearts. Redeem us for sin, bondage, addiction, and slavery. Set us free. And Jesus, you are the savior of the whole world. We welcome you into the, every little corner of the world. We welcome you into our little corner of the world. And we join you in prayer for the ends of the earth. We want everyone to know you. I found a verse in Psalm 69, 9 in the New Living Translation, and it says this, the river of God has plenty of water.
plenty of water for every one of our situations, for every one of our hearts, for every one of our homes, for every one of our communities, for every part of our nation, for every part of our world. And that's what I'm claiming. The river of God has plenty of water.